Here are the top five game-breaking low-level spells in D&D. Okay, so Glyph of Warding is a third-level spell, and just FYI, every spell on this list is going to be third level or lower. It takes an hour to cast and lets you inscribe a glyph on a surface that stores a magical effect, either a spell or an explosion. Example, you cast Glyph of Warding on the door to your base, and then you set the trigger to be whenever anyone that isn't you walks through that door. Then a rogue Aracocra stumbles in, triggers the glyph, casts fireball, and everyone gets pre-cooked KFC for dinner. You can set the trigger to your glyph to be as vague or as specific as you like, and the spell will go off when that trigger is met. If the spell has a target, it targets the person who triggered it. If the spell is concentration, it simply lasts the full duration of the spell without needing to uh, concentrate on it. Downside. When you cast Glyph of Warding on an object, that object can't be moved more than 10 feet, otherwise the glyph breaks and the spell disappears without doing anything. Also, it costs 200 golds worth of powdered diamonds every time you cast it, so you know, it's, it's pricey. But damn, it is worth it, because this thing is busted. The real power of Glyph of Warding is to set up multiple concentration effects at the same time. If you can prep an area where you know there is going to be a fight, Batman style, you can set up insane advantages and traps. So far, so good. You can booby trap an area to give yourself some simultaneous effects. That's good, but it's not broken. Until you take one level in Warlock. So genie warlocks get this thing called Bottled Respite, where they have their own little demiplane inside a tiny object, and they can enter it as an action and leave as a bonus action. It's cool, but here's the important part. Inside that object exists an extra dimensional space. It exists outside the material plane. The object is just the gateway. That means any glyphs of warding you cast inside your genie vessel will not be destroyed if the vessel moves more than 10 feet. The glyphs don't move. They're staying exactly where you left them inside that separate dimension. And this also works with a bag of holding. Boom! You now have a way to carry around glyphs of warding. You can set up a ton of insane buff spells like haste, bark skin, enlarge, reduce, and invisibility and set them to trigger on a command word that you speak while inside your vessel. Then, whenever a fight kicks off, you can vanish inside your vessel, speak the command word, and get more juiced up than Lance Armstrong with simultaneous buff effects. This is completely insane. There is a reason why you can only concentrate on one spell at a time. Balance. There are also a ton of cool combos you can set up with this, combining a bunch of interesting effects, like every single type of Paladin Smite, together at once for the ultimate God Slap. However, it does cost a lot of gold to use this, and once you use it once, all your glyphs are burned and you need to start again from scratch. Still, unlimited simultaneous concentration effects is crazy and easily breakable at any point in the game. Glyph of Warding is definitely a reason DMs need to be careful about handing out too much money to the players. Let's shift to something a little more subtle but equally game-breaking. Suggestion is a second level concentration spell that lets you suggest a course of activity limited to a sentence or two to another creature who can hear and understand you. Creatures that can't be charmed are immune. Now you have to suggest something in a manner that sounds reasonable. So telling a creature to stab itself or otherwise harm itself will break the spell. Then they make a wisdom save and on a fail, they pursue that course of action to the best of their ability until the spell ends or one of your allies attack them. All right, so there are two main things that are busted about this. Firstly, the suggestion does not need to be a good idea. It just needs to sound reasonable. The example the spell gives is that you suggest to a knight that she gives her horse to the first beggar she meets. Now that is not a good idea, considering a war horse in D&D costs 400 gold pieces. This is kind of like saying to a policeman, go and give your car to the next homeless person you see. 400 gold is a year's salary in this game. And if give your 400 gold war horse to the next beggar you meet is a reasonable suggestion, then and why not just give your 400 gold warhorse to me instead? I mean, it's the same difference, right? It's just this time you're the guy who ends up with the warhorse. This is a scammer's wet dream of a spell, and it could very quickly generate massive income. But it's not only a path to massive wealth in D&D, it's also amazing in combat too. You can just eliminate an enemy with this effect. Run away so we don't kill you is an excellent suggestion. One failed wisdom save, and that Abolith is on the first train 
Queen out of here. Honestly, this spell is a better banishment, one of the best 4th level spells, because it removes someone from combat for 8 hours, rather than just 1 minute. It also pairs incredibly well with the Tongues spell, a buff effect that lets you communicate with anyone regardless of language barriers. So we have a ridiculously powerful suck or save effect that lasts 8 hours and we can generate a ton of money. Already broken, but it gets worse. According to Jeremy Crawford, the rules as intended for this spell say that your suggestion only needs to sound reasonable at the time of casting. So you could, taking JC at his word, suggest to someone that they stand perfectly still for 8 hours, and then set about building a contraption that will drop a giant rock on their head. Even though it is obviously a terrible idea to just stand there. As long as you don't deal any damage to them until you kill them, they will not move, because the suggestion was totally reasonable at the time of casting. Now I do think that's a bit crazy, I think that's taking it way too far, but I wanted to mention it because according to the sage advice and rules as written, it is allowed. So DMs, you do need to be ready to communicate exactly what suggestion can and can't do when your players take it. Even without that though, suggestion is insane and arguably the most breakable second level spell in D&D. D. Because, let's be real, it's basically free mind control from level 3. Also, the old version of the yuan -Ti could cast it for free at level 1, because game balance is for cowards, apparently. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. I have a confession. <clears throat> I have a problem getting wood. Uh, excuse me, what? But I will have wood again, putting the wood back in my worm with wormwood. Purveyors of high-end wooden gaming accessories for Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, I thought you were talking about, like, erections and, and stuff. As well you might, for when I first laid eyes on the Wormwood Dice Vault with room for ten polyhedral dice held together with four rare earth magnets, I did indeed feel aroused for the first time in seven long years. Stop! Stop talking! Stop saying things! Why, one would even made the custom DM screen for Matthew Mercer of Clitoral Hole. Critical Role. Exactly! Wormwood! For the greatest gaming accessories in D&D. Use code D&D Shorts for free dice. Link in description. Okay, let's talk about Conjure Animals. The spell's so nice, it breaks D&D twice. One, it is ridiculously strong to the point of being broken, and two, it literally causes the game to break down. Let's talk. Conjure Animals is a third level concentration spell that lets you summon fey spirits in the form of beasts. You can get between 1 to 8 creatures when you cast it at third level, and the more creatures you get, the less powerful each one is individually. Look, as anyone who knows anything about action economy will tell you, the more allies you have on the board, the better things are going to be. For that reason, it is always best to summon 8 creatures with Conjure Animals. Rules as written. You decide the challenge rating of the beasts that appear, and your DM is the one who actually picks them. A lot of players don't realize this, but yeah, you don't get to choose. That's already kind of a problem, because if your DM doesn't want to frustrate or upset you, which they hopefully don't, they're under a lot of pressure to give you something good. Because you know what sucks? Using your only third level spell slot and getting 8 goldfish. Wolves, velociraptors, giant owls, these are the good choices, and many DMs will just let you pick rather than potentially upset their players. That's totally understandable, but it leads to the spell being completely overpowered. Now I don't gotta tell you why summoning 8 wolves next to an enemy, each one attacking at advantage thanks to pack tactics, is completely completely insane. But aside from the damage and the action economy, just putting a lot of bodies on the field really gums up the map, drawing fire away from you and onto your spirits. It's almost like stunning an enemy without a saving throw, if they have to use an entire turn battering through your beasts. And the D&D designers know this is a problem. They never publish these multi-summon spells anymore. All the new spells are single creature summons, because multiple creature summon spells are just way too strong, 
and also really boring. This is the other side to conjure animals. It can slow the game down so much that it just breaks. Let's say your druid summons eight giant owls. I mean, that's cool, that is what the spell is supposed to do, but you've just added eight creatures to the game. In a complicated fight with loads of different things going on, it's not unreasonable that each owl would need to do something different. Then the druid has gone from taking one turn per round to taking nine which could honestly take half an hour. And then the DM has to track the hit points of all the summons individually, and if you're a Circle of the Shepherd's Druid, they've got to track all the various buff effects on them as well. Honestly, it gets boring. Even for the Druid, it gets boring, and the game just falls apart. There are solutions to this, limiting the amount of summons, or my personal favorites, giving every player two of the eight beasts to control on their turn can really spread the fun around and keep things moving. But if you don't know about these fixes and some new players tried Conjure Animals, it wouldn't be their fault or the DM's fault if the game just fell apart. An encounter or even an entire session can be completely derailed just because this spell is kind of badly designed. Use with extreme caution. All right, so here's the newest spell on this list. Silvery Barbs is a first level reaction spell which you take when a creature you can see within range succeeds on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Basically, you force them to re-roll and use the lower roll, potentially causing a success to fail. Then you can target another creature within range, including yourself, and give them advantage on their next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw within the next minute. Okay, a few things first. One. This does not beat legendary resistances. If a creature uses their legendary resistance to succeed on an effect, Silvery Barbs will not change that. Whatever they roll, they automatically succeed. Two, you can't use this on an ally who fails a save to try and give them advantage. It only works when someone succeeds on something and you try and make them fail. So how strong is this spell? Well, for a start, no one is ever getting crit. Anytime a creature scores a critical hit against anyone in the party, you can just force them to re-roll, reducing the chances of a crit from a 1 in 20 to a 1 in 400. Sure, it can still happen, but it is extremely rare. But also, Silvery Barbs negates any advantage a creature might have. Example, an enemy rogue uses Steady Aim to give themselves advantage on the next arrow they fire, and they hit you. But if you Silvery Barbs, you essentially cancel out that advantage, forcing them to roll one one more d20 and taking the lower of the final rolls. Silvery Barbs doesn't care about any amount of effort you put into getting advantage. It just ignores it. It's also quite handy for juicing up skill checks. If a party member is attempting something really important, you can just make an unarmed attack against them, dealing one damage, and Silvery Barbs yourself to try and force a miss. Then you can just pass along the advantage part of the spell to that party member. If the help action isn't really feasible for this skill check, this is a solid use of Silvery Barbs. But the real power is in pushing through suck or save effects. Let's say you cast a Dominate Person. If this baby lands on an enemy, the fight is basically over. If they succeed initially, you just hit them with Silvery Barbs, retroactively giving them disadvantage. So this is a better version of the Sorcerer's heightened spell Metamagic. That one costs three sorcery points to force disadvantage, but you need to use it before you cast the spell. That means if you cast a heightened spell dominate person and they fail on their first roll, you've essentially wasted those three sorcery points because they would have failed anyway. However, Silvery Barbs lets you wait until after they've succeeded before you expend any resources to try and make them fail. And of course, heightened spell costs three sorcery points, but an aberrant mind sorcerer can use Silvery Barbs for just one. Finally, there is no limit on how many times a roll can be Silvery Barbs. Barbsed. So if you have a bunch of spellcasters in the party, you can all take turns, repeatedly forcing a creature to re-roll that crucial save until they eventually, inevitably fail. Also, re-rolling dice constantly slows the game down. I run a pretty fast game of D&D, and I'm usually halfway through the next sentence describing what happens before someone remembers to cast Silvery Barbs and we all have to go back and start again. Silvery Barbs also further tilts the balance of power in D&D towards spellcasters and away from martial characters. When Hold Monster or Banishment can just end a fight instantly and Silvery Barbs makes them super reliable, it leads to a further unbalancing of these already powerful spells. How can a fighter really compete when a wizard can force through Dominate Person so often and so easily? Honestly, I think Silvery Barbs should be a second level spell. 
That way it's not quite as abusable and you can't pick it up nearly as easily through the Magic Initiate or Fey Touched feats. Before we get to the next entry, I just want to throw a shout out to Magic Mouth. It's not inherently that powerful. It lets you store a message inside an object, kind of like Glyph of Warding, but instead of storing a spell, you store words. However, when optimized by a big brain artificer, this spell can be used to create a functioning information relay network. This spell can make the internet. I've linked the original thread on Giant in the Playground where someone came up with this down below if you want to give it a read. It's incredible. And obviously, being able to create Twitter in a medieval fantasy setting is completely insane. Okay, time for the hot, spicy take of the video. Find Familiar is broken. I know, I know what you're thinking, but please hear me out and I will try and explain. Just because everyone takes Find Familiar, and most of the time it's completely fine, doesn't mean that it can't be completely broken if you use it optimally. To start, Find Familiar is the cornerstone of a ton of other broken combos. The Bag of Holding Bomb that can one-shot a Tarask at level 2 is only possible thanks to Find Familiar. Dimension Warp Murder Kitten, Imp Airlines, Skeleton Hand Grenade, Dimension Fortress, all these ridiculous combos, linked below if you want more information, need Find Familiar. But how about another combo? How about instant regeneration from death at level 3? A Pact of the Chain Warlock can summon an Imp who can turn invisible, and anything it is carrying is also invisible. Now, just give it a standing order to pour a potion of healing down your throat anytime you get knocked down. All an enemy will see is you getting knocked down, coughing, swallowing something, and then standing up again with a few hit points over and over. That is badass and incredibly hard to stop. As long as you have potions in your backpack, your imp can just keep doing this. But there's so much more. Combo find familiar with the Chronergy Wizard's Arcane Abeyance. Now your familiar can hold concentration on a spell for you, letting you hit two concentration effects at once. That's an ability reserved for the CR26 Niv-Mizzet and nobody else because it's completely broken. Basically, any combat encounter is trivialized if you can throw up a wall of force and sickening radiance all the enemies trapped inside. This simple combo one-shots any creatures without teleportation or dispel magic. And then, of course, at the very least, your familiar gives you advantage on your first melee attack of the turn every turn for the entire game. What fighter or rogue wouldn't want this? Your owl familiar can fly down, take the help action to give you advantage, and fly off without provoking opportunity attacks. Then it also scouts, gives advantage on skill checks, can use magic items, can deal damage with spells like Dragon's Breath, it just goes on and on. Now sure, familiars don't have that much HP and your enemies will target it and kill it if you play it aggressively. But still, this is one spell that can do all the things we've just talked about, and it doesn't even cost a spell slot. You start the game with this. It's available at level 1 to any class via the Magic Initiate or Ritual Caster feats. Find Familiar is the most powerful spell in the game when you factor in its strengths versus its cost. It is extremely breakable when used optimally. And also also one of the most fun spells in the game. In fact, hell, it is my favorite spell in the game. Okay, so I'm not telling you to break these spells, and I'm not telling you to ban them either. These are all uh, really good spells, but knowing their potential as a player, and knowing when to slam the brakes on as a DM, can only lead to more healthy and creative and exciting games of D&D. I've also made a video where I go through a bunch of old busted combos and talk about improving them, which is out now on Patreon for all subscribers. If you want more powerful combo ideas, you can check out the Patreon by clicking the link up here or down there. However, if you really can't afford to support right now, but you really want to see the video, just float me a DM on Discord and I will make sure I get it to you. But of course, if you can support, there's a bunch of other awesome things on Patreon, including other bonus videos. Aside from that, remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel, and I'll see you next time.